Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Millman, Communications Director at uh, Payne BC, and I want to welcome all of you to uh, part two of the Introduction to Mindfulness Meditation for Chronic Pain. This webinar series is, is a five-part series, and it's brought to you in partnership by the Canadian Institute for the Relief of Pain and Disability, uh, Payne BC, and Langara College. Um, a note about the audio uh, problems last uh, week. We apologize for those. We have since uh, purchased a um, headset, and we're hoping that the audio is going to be much improved um, this uh, session. But please let us know if you're having any trouble through the chat or uh, via email. Uh, today we'll be exploring uh, practicing awareness. Where does the mind go? And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter, uh, Linda Turner. Uh, Linda is the Program Manager of Health and uh, Human Services at Langara College in the Continuing Studies Department. She studied with John Kabat-Zinn to learn how to teach mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, also known as MBSR. She received her MBSR teacher certificate from the University of Massachusetts Medical School Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and Society. Linda has taught the eight-week MBSR program over the past 10 years to patients in pain and members of the general public. This course is offered through Langara Continuing Studies at least twice per year. Now let's turn things over uh, to Linda. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming back. And I'd like to begin this session with ringing the meditation bells and inviting everyone to come into their body. So I'm going to just ring these bells. And as I do, I'd like to invite you I'd like to invite you to coming in, come into your seats, taking a deep breath all the way down to the bottom of the lungs. And come into this moment, just this moment, not the moments that you were rushing to get here. Becoming aware of what is going on in the body right now. Feeling the feet on the ground. the pressure of the chair underneath you. Perhaps feeling your heart beating. Noticing any tension in the body, is the neck, shoulders, is there any tension there already this morning? And if you will, continuing to breathe deeply and slowly and evenly. Informing the intention to be present 
for our talk here this morning. We will begin. And I'd like to begin with some questions that have come in during the week, and I think they're very important questions to bring up at this moment. And the title of our presentation is Practicing Awareness. And I'll move on to the first presentation, or maybe not. Oh, there. Okay, so the first question that came in, and we will keep the questions anonymous, so feel free to ask any question you like. This came from last week. In the web seminar, while I was meditating and did a body scan, the pain was so intense, very increased, horrible sensation that created my mind racing and trying to find a way from, away from the pain, which I couldn't do as I kept bringing myself back to the meditation. Is there a way to get through this as it is not a pleasant experience? And indeed, it is not a pleasant experience. And this is one of the issues in working with chronic pain. It's very, very important to take your medication as it is prescribed while you're doing this practice. So it would not be a good thing to do is to stop taking the meditation before doing any of these practices. Make sure you've taken your medication and that you are as pain controlled as possible because the easiest way to work with this sensation is to keep it as dull as possible to begin with because we're actually focusing on the pain. And so what I'm going to ask or invite you to do, it's, it's tricky, is that if you can notice this pain in the body and notice how you're holding it in your body, if you can notice if there's a feeling of trying to push it away or tension around it. And if you are able to relax this tension around the pain, around the pain, painful area, and continue breathing as best as possible, just notice the sensation. And I know it's uncomfortable, but I'd like to encourage you to try to relax around it and invite this area of your body back into your body, as it were. So holding it gently, holding it as you would a small child, is this little area in your body is experiencing discomfort. And holding it like you would a baby, in a way, is noticing it and relaxing around it and holding it very, very gently. And through this, if you can begin to explore a little bit of the dialogue that's going on in the mind at that time. So it's a pretty tricky process, not easy at all. I wish I could give you an easy solution to it, but it's difficult. But continue breathing and being very gentle with yourself, holding yourself in a very gentle, kind way as you would a small child. And just gently slowly look to explore the area around the pain and discomfort. And when we're exploring the pain and discomfort, we're exploring the tension in the body as well as the dialogue in the mind and the tension in other areas of the body. So just becoming acutely aware of where all we're holding this pain in the body. I hope that this is helpful. It usually is. It's a slow process, and it has to be a very, very gentle process with oneself. I'm going to just bring up some of the other questions that came in this week. And one question came from a participant who said, can you suggest some strategies to help chronic pain sufferers recognize their cognitive errors about pain for those who deny this or who deny that there is a mind-body connection? For example, deny that the anger or frustration cause an increase in their pain. Now, this question is an interesting one. Basically, I can't give you an answer for what is true for you. You are the only person who can find that answer. It has to be a very, very kind and gentle self-exploration with what goes on for you. So it's beginning to look at what comes up in your mind. And sometimes it's pretty tough to do to look at ourselves, honestly. It's 
just really a hard thing to do to see myself as a person that I'm not putting out to the world. So we're asking everyone to be extremely courageous and look within themselves and be very honest with themselves about what is going on. And so it's a bit of a tricky process is that we're looking honestly at our thoughts and then noticing what's going on at the bo in the body at the same time. So noticing where there's tension and if you're angry, are you tightening your fists? Are you tightening your body? And is the pain increasing? So it takes a little bit of practice with this work to actually get really good at it, but I really do assure that it's worth the practice and it's worth the time and the gentleness with oneself to look within. So I hope that these questions or these answers are helpful and we will talk a little bit more about this as we go on. We'll go now into the presentation and see if we can do some more exploring around this process. So last week we talked about this descending inhibitory pathway, which is a very direct link between the mind and the body through a spinal cord pathway and this pathway is activated by our mind, our mind, our thought processes and the thoughts that come out from the mind and travel down this descending inhibitory pathway to the body. And what we're trying to do is to close the road to the pain basically in any way that's possible is actually shutting off the process of pain transmission from the periphery to experience of pain. And as we talked about last week, this is entirely possible because people who live in other countries and are more skilled with meditation than we are, are actually able to do this somewhat randomly through their ability to control the body through the mind. And I'm sure you have heard of people who have had surgery under hypnosis, people who have um, actually some some dentists practice dentistry with hypnosis so that the mind can be extremely powerful. However, the mind has to be trained before it can become powerful. And so that is the work that we are undertaking in this process is training our mind to actually be present and to be in this moment to in, in order to facilitate changing the processes that go on in the body. And those were the pictures from last week. And so this program we talked about last week. And basically, I wanted to put this slide up again because the focus of the program is on what is right with you and not what is wrong with you. So it's on working with all of our very many strengths and working in areas where we have a lot of good things to work with. We have a lot of capacity and we have a lot of ability to actually cope very, very well. So it's focusing on this right part of us, this part of us that can cope through anything and can work with anything. And so that's where we are focusing our attention for the, for the stress reduction portion of the meditation. So the awareness that we're talking about, it's a little bit tricky to um, bring out and to point out to people. And it's because we're mostly not aware and we're not present. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. So what we're looking to try and bring awareness to are the body sensations, so the things that are going on in the physical body, the thoughts that are going on in the mind, and then the emotions that arise because of the thoughts that we're thinking. And so as I mentioned, we don't always bring attention to our awareness. And much of the day, we're on automatic pilot. And attending to the body and the breath brings us into the present moment immediately. So I'm going to put this slide up of the automatic pilot and I'm going to ask everyone to look into their lives and notice for themselves, have you ever been on autopilot? Have you ever driven all the way home and forgotten the route that you took to get there? 
Have you ever gone all day without eating? Have you ever come home from work and you have a headache and you notice that your shoulders are up around your ears, but you don't remember exactly the first moment of those shoulders going up around your ears? Or do you ever push yourself past the point of your body saying, I'm tired or I'm hungry? or I need something from you. I need for you to listen to what's going on for me. Does that ever happen to anybody in our audience? And if you like, you could send your response to Michael and and we can talk about it at the end or now. But do those things ever happen? Do you ever find yourself putting the milk in the cupboard, for example? Or do you ever go to look for something and you forgot what you've gone to look for? So those are all examples in our very busy lives that we end up on autopilot and we actually aren't aware of where our mind is taking us. We don't know where our mind is taking us because we aren't present to notice where it's taking us. So if you can be really honest with yourself and notice those times when you've done things like that, we are going to try and bring ourselves back to this moment with a kind and gentle attention. And so the mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn defines it as intentional, moment-to-moment, non-judgmental attention. So we're noticing intentionally in this moment and very importantly in a non-judgmental way. So in a way that we are not beating ourselves up for having a mind that's wandering. We are gently and kindly holding ourselves and looking to see what goes on in our mind and body. So it's a very kind way of holding ourselves and very important to make it a kind kindness to oneself because the, if we beat ourselves up, it just makes it all worse and it doesn't help anything at all. So this paying attention on purpose in a particular way. And so it's a little bit difficult to explain when we haven't tried to do it. So I'm going to invite you to go back to your experience in the body scan and to remember what it was like in practicing the body scan. And so some of the things that typically come up when we're practicing the body scan is the mind wanders. So it doesn't want to be there. It escapes to another place. And so the mind, it is trained to think. And it has learned its lesson well as we've all gone to school all the way through grade 12 and sometimes more. We have learned that thinking is valuable in our society and so we have learned how to think really very well. And the mind is only too happy to take us away on its thought processes. And so it quite often will take off wherever it wants to go. So that's a common experience with mindfulness meditation is the mind takes off and goes where it wants to go. So when that happens, if you can continue breathing deeply, slowly, and evenly, and bring your attention back to the breath, but at the same time, if you can notice where the mind went, where did it go? It pulled you someplace, and where was that place? Was that place to your work or to something that you were worrying about in the past or in the future? Is that where the mind went? So it's important to notice where your mind takes you when it goes away. So that's one part of the mindfulness, paying attention on purpose in a particular way. Another thing that might have come up with the body scan is there might have been an unwillingness to go into certain body areas because maybe they hurt or there's something held in that tissue that we don't want to be aware of. And so again, with a gentle kindness, looking within that body part and seeing what is there with a gentle curiosity in a way is, oh, isn't that interesting? I'm holding that area of the body tight. I wonder what that is about. And maybe exploring a little bit about why we're holding the body tight. So 
The value in the mindfulness awareness is in the practice, so in becoming aware of what goes on in the mind and body in the process of being present and noticing, just noticing, so paying attention on purpose in a particular way. And the particular way is in a gentle, kind, non-judgmental way. So these interwoven aspects of this process, of this cyclic process, is that there's the intention to pay attention and to notice. There's the attention to everything that's going on in the mind, the body, and the emotion. There's the attitude that comes with it, is our attitude towards this exploration, uh, how we're holding ourselves, how we're doing it, are we beating ourselves up because we're not doing it right. And then this leads to a connection between the mind and body and a, an absolute presence in the moment. So a connection between the two is what we're hoping to establish, is to notice what goes on in the mind and notice what goes on in the emotion, and then to attend to it and to then explore it with nothing more than an interest in knowing how it is we process various kinds of stimuli, noticing, just noticing. And that is the first step to the awareness process, is that we can't make any changes or do anything differently if we aren't aware of where our mind takes us. And so it's a very delicate, intricate exploration of the mind and the body. So this intention to pay attention, the attention to what's going on in all the aspects of being, and then our attitude towards these things. So our attitude is how we're holding it. Are we beating ourselves up? Or are we looking at ourselves with curiosity and like our own best friend, which is what we're aiming for, is to be our own best friend and to be very gentle and kind with ourselves in this process. Because it's hard. It is hard for sure. It's very hard to do this work. And then we're looking at the connection and the presence in the body. And so through this process, we are able to connect the mind and body and to then begin to notice what goes on in the mind and how it affects the body and the intention and the or the body, the attitude, the emotion, and the feelings within the body. So that is the first step in being able to make any changes is to become aware of what it is we do in our own mind and body. This is a unique process for every person on the face of the earth. Every person will have a unique way of being in the situation. Is not any two people will have the same thought processes, the same kinds of things that come up for them as a result of a stimulus. Everyone has their own way of dealing with it. And so because of this uniqueness of our mind, body, emotion situation, we are the only ones who can find our way through the maze of what goes on in the mind and body. We are the only ones who can notice how we can maybe make a change or maybe not. We are the ones that have to determine this. So the attention is observing moment by moment experience. And so through the process of observing the experience, we are hopefully able to return to things in themselves. So by attending to the contents of our consciousness moment by moment, we can begin to separate our thoughts from the sensation in the body. So that if, for example, there's a pain in, in my foot, then through the process of observing the moment to moment experience, if I'm really very careful with noticing, I can notice that the pain comes up and then I have a judgment about it. I don't like that pain. I don't want that pain to be there. I think that pain is there because of some reason that I have in my mind. And I then am noticing, I can begin to notice that maybe the pain gets worse when I have that thought. So if we are able to 
notice the actual sensation in the body, and if we can, without judging it or without naming it. So we're noticing a sensation in the body, and if we can notice that the thoughts that we have around it are separate than the sensation. And so the tricky thing with the thoughts is that the thoughts aren't necessarily true. They are our thoughts. They are not necessarily true. They are things that we have been used to thinking all of our lives. And so this is a really tricky process of bringing awareness to the sensation and then noticing the sensation and then noticing our thoughts and our emotions that are piled on top of the sensation. And that takes a lot of courage to look at ourselves honestly and see what is going on for ourselves in that moment. So because of the trickiness of this process, we need to use these attitudes within our process of mindfulness meditation. And these attitudes, I believe, we sent them out this week. Um, they are the foundational attitudes of mindfulness. And we'll go over them again just briefly, is that we need to use this acceptance. So we're accepting what is. So that things are the way they are in our lives. And they're not necessarily good or bad or they're, they just are. There's nothing in it. We need to make sure that we are trying our best to just accept whatever is. And so sometimes when things we try to fight against what is, that creates a lot of tension in the body. And I don't know if anyone's ever had the experience of trying to make something happen that just is not easily happening. And you tend to create a lot of a lot of tension in the body and forcing and trying to push. And when we're not accepting what is in the in the body or in the in our life situation we basically create a lot of tension in ourselves, and so we are the only ones who suffer related to trying to make things different. The second one is non-judging. So not judging the way in which we're thinking or what we're doing, just noticing. So just noticing, just noticing. So sometimes a good way to look at it is in an open way, an openness, an openness to whatever is, and then a gentle curiosity is that, isn't that interesting? Here I am holding myself really tense and tight because I'm angry about something. Isn't that interesting? And is this a way that I often am in, in my life? Is this something that comes up for me often? So just a curiosity. A curiosity and as though you are your own best friend holding yourself gently and looking at yourself with a gentle curiosity, a gentle curiosity, and then a trust, a trust in ourselves to know what is right and what is good for us. So a trust in how we are, a kindness with ourselves. Very important to be very kind with ourselves and very, very gentle so that we are our own best friends. Often, if we are really honest with ourselves, we beat ourselves up quite a lot. And we look in the mirror and we say, oh my God, do I ever look fat today? I look terrible today. I look horrible today. And if we really realized, we would never say that to our best friend. We would never say that to any other person. So it's a kindness with oneself. Very kind and just noticing. Then a non-striving. So not Again, trying to force against the way things are, not striving, not pushing against what is. Then a patience, a patience with everything that is in our lives, a patience. A patience and a gentle kindness of allowing things to unfold as they do. A letting go of trying to make things different and a gentleness. And so for these Foundations of mindfulness are enormously important in holding ourselves with these basic attitudes towards what is going on. So if we can practice those for the duration of our time together, and maybe even longer, and see where that helps us. So we are just going to, I want to just talk a little bit about about these attitudes. And uh, for example, 
So a for example is that our lives are our lives, and not everything is perfect in our lives. Sometimes it's perfect. It doesn't often last so very long. So life is life. It happens. It happens. Stressful situations happen. Things happen in our lives, and many times we have no control over those things that happen. And so if we are able to, with a very gentle curiosity, notice how the, how we respond to these things, how we react to these things. And so that's what we're looking at right now is how we react to what is in our lives. So how we react to what is going on in our lives. Because if we're really honest with ourselves, the only thing that we can do is change our reaction to the situation. We can't change the situation often. Sometimes we can. If we can, that's good, and then we would go about making that change. But in many, many situations in our lives, we can't change the situation. We have to look at the situation, and then what is helpful is to notice how we react to the situation. And that's where the awareness is coming, is in being really honest with ourselves about how we react. And if we can, using these basic principles of mindfulness as our attitude, and holding ourselves with a gentle kindness, and just noticing what comes up for us in response to the situations that are going on in our life. So we're going to practice with this for the next little while and explore a little bit more about where this leads us. So what I want to talk about now is what is the content of our thoughts? Where do they come from? Where do our thoughts come from? And so since we're looking so closely at these thoughts and emotions that arise in our own mind-body, we need to be really gentle and explore where our thoughts come from. So oftentimes we have learned the way of thinking and the way of coping from our family of origin, from our lives that we've lived. So that's why everyone's thoughts and everyone's ways of coping are so unique. It's because everyone has had a different life up until this point in time. And so we have formed this way of coping over many, many, many years of our lives. And so we have our own way of being with certain kinds of situations. So what I'm going to invite people to do over the next week is to begin to explore our rules, our rules in our lives. And so a for example of our rules might be is do we have to be on time for things? Do we have to make the bed before we leave the house? Do we have to get things done no matter what? Do we have to eat all of our food off the plate? Do we have to um, work very, very hard to get things done? We all have rules. And if we never start to, if we never look at these rules again from the time that we learn them until now, we'd never really notice if they're helpful to us or not. So are our rules helpful to us? Are they still helping us and guiding our life in a positive way? Or would it be better if our body says it's tired, would it be better to allow our body to rest? So those are the sorts of things I would invite you to look at over the next week is what are our rules for ourselves? And then from our rules, what kind of boxes do we put ourselves in? What kind of things do we tell ourselves that we have to do because we've always done it that way? What kinds of ways do we hold ourselves in a situation because we have always done it that way? Do we have to wash the dishes before we leave the house in the morning? Do we have to make the bed before we leave the house in the morning? Do we always have to be an hour ahead for a meeting? Do we really have to do those sorts of things? And so noticing how we hold ourselves in a place and then Asking the question, is this, a, is this a helpful place to hold ourselves these days? Is, it, is this still serving us? Is this really helping us? Then I'm going to invite you to look and see where do our stories go? Where do our stories go? So we all have a story and we all have 
we all have our own story in different situations. So, for example, if you have an argument with someone, then you have a story about, well, I'm right, and I don't know why that person thinks they're right, because after all, I'm right, and these are the reasons I'm right. And this person doesn't know what they're doing because I know I'm right. And so I'm going to ask you to very gently and kindly look at what our stories are about. And are they in touch with reality? Are they real? Or are they our drama? Are they the things that we tell ourselves? Because we always do. Because, I mean, we we are the most important person on our lives because we are the star of our lives. We have our own stories and what we tell ourselves. So just with almost a gentle curiosity and amusement, look and see what we tell ourselves. And then look a little bit further and see what those stories cause in our body and what the emotions are that come up. So I mentioned this before, is if you look in the mirror and you say, do I ever look awful today? I look so fat. I'm getting really old. Oh my goodness, I think maybe I better go for some plastic surgery and fix things up here. This is not looking good. I need to lose 10 pounds. Okay, if you say that to yourself when you look in the mirror in the morning, then very soon after that you start to feel kind of bad about yourself because, well, almost anyone would if you were beating them up like that. And so it's actually catching these thoughts and these emotions that come up from our stories, from our mind, when they're coming up. So just with a gentle kind of curiosity looking to see where it is we take ourselves and what it is we do to ourselves. And so what I'd like to do for just a second is a little brief exercise is just taking a deep breath and sinking in to the body mind and feeling you, your feet on the floor and I'm going to ask you What's going on in your mind right now? And it can be anything. It can be anything. If you think what I'm saying is absolute nonsense, that's okay. That's okay. Just noticing, what are your thoughts? What are your judgments? What do you think about what's been said so far today? And any thought is just fine. Any thought that you have is just fine. What I'd like you to invite you to do is to explore the thought. Explore the thought. And then for a minute, if you can imagine or if you can remember, does this thought come up in any other aspect of your life? Do you have these thoughts often? And then if you can ask another question of where did this thought come from? Where did this way of thinking come from? Is this my mom? Is this my dad? Is this my uncle? And just with a curiosity, noticing for yourself, not with any necessary necessity to change the thought at all, but just bringing awareness to it. Where did it come from? Is it helpful to me in my life? And 
and what happens in my mind and body as a result of the thought. So for the week ahead, I'm going to invite you to look within all of the thoughts that come up in various moments of the day and just bring awareness to what comes up. Just bring awareness to the origin of the thought, what happens in the mind and body as a result of the thought, and does this thought come up often for me? What about this thought? Okay. And so through the practice of mindfulness, what happens is a shift in perspective. So we are often able to shift our perspective if we're really honest with ourselves about attending to all that is in our mind and body. So through the meditation practice, through the intentionally paying attention with acceptance and openness and using the attitudes we talked about, we can experience a shift in perspective. We can experience a change in the way in which we see things. So the shift in perspective comes through reperceiving something. And so a for example is if we can begin looking at things as though we were a small child. So as a small child, everything was fascinating to us because we had never seen it before. And it was coming to us as though for the first time. And we were looking at things through the eyes of a baby or a child, we were seeing it as for the first time. It was amazing to us. It was new to us. It was something that we'd never seen before. And now what often has happened in our lives is that we often don't see the thing itself. We see our story about the thing. Is that we have a story about the thing, about the per about the person, about the situation we're in that we tell ourselves, and that we don't see the thing itself. We see our story. So through the process of the meditation, we're hoping to take apart the whole conglomerate of our mind, our body, our thoughts, our emotion, and notice as though for the first time. So we are going to look at things through beginner's eyes, through beginner's eyes for the next little while together, looking at things as though for the first time. So through the reperceiving, what we're hoping to accomplish is this rotation of consciousness. And it's ha it helps to have to disidentify with the contents of our consciousness and be able to see freshly and clearly with an objectivity and a clarity about what really is rather than being immersed in the drama of our story. And so we're able to stand back and witness it. We can see at this thing, this situation, so that if we are able to witness it, we're able to realize that we're much, much bigger than the thing itself. What we're, when we're immersed in the drama, all we see are our thoughts. And if we can stand back, we can actually see the thing itself and realize that we are much bigger than it. So Daniel Goldman says that the phenomenon contemplated are distinct from the mind contemplating them. So I'm going to ask... Michael, now, if there are any questions that people have had through the process of our conversation this morning? Yes, uh, there are some questions. Can you hear me okay, Linda? Yes, yes. Um, so let me just read a couple of the questions. Uh, we had a question. In the body scan, I found that my body grew increasingly uncomfortable with lying flat. Um, and then she wonders if there's anything she can do to address this. But I think when you're doing a body scan, it's important to find a comfortable position, as comfortable as you can. If you can't lie flat, then just find a different position. So maybe lying on your side or sitting up in a chair. The purpose of the exercise is more to bring ourselves into our body and notice what is, but not to increase the pain in any way. So certainly move, sit in a chair, 
uh, lie in a different position, find a comfortable way to lie, and then do the body scan. So sitting or moving yourself into a comfortable position with pillows or things around you to help you. And there's not any need to make it uncomfortable. So finding a position that you're able to bring your mind into your body and notice what is. That's the purpose of the exercise is noticing what is, not trying to make it more uncomfortable. Mm, great. We got another interesting question here. The um, attendee uh, asks, I read somewhere that men feel with their heads and women with their bodies. Is that the reason that more women attend this kind of seminar or get more out of this kind of um, work, or is it something else? Well, I don't know if I should even answer. I think probably we do find a lot of our courses at Langara College are mostly attended by women. Maybe it's because women are more insightful. I don't know, but I don't think that's a good thing that we would <laughs> answer that in any positive fashion. I think probably it's the, the insightfulness, the looking within oneself um, tends to come more easily to women, but there are definitely some insightful men that are able to develop the capacity, and we all, we, the human mind is the same in men and women. It's very busy, and so, what we're encouraging is that looking within, just looking within our own body mind is where we're aiming to go with this. And I don't think there's any, there's certainly no research that would indicate that one gender is, is superior to another. I think, I think it's just the capacity to look within. Mm -hmm. um, we have one here uh, that sort of echoes some of the um, feelings from the first question that we dealt with at the beginning. Uh, an attendee writes, when doing the mindful body scan, I notice a number of different areas in the body that are causing trouble, pain, muscle tension, bright lights behind the eyelids. What do we do with these as the mind wants to linger on these points? That's a really very good question, very interesting, is that we are not doing anything with them at this point. We are just noticing. So just noticing where the body wants to linger, and if the body wants to linger or if the mind wants to linger in a certain place, then if we can notice the sensation first and then the area around the sensation and then if we can notice what the mind has to say about the sensation, and then if we can notice any emotion in the body that arises as a result of those sensations, that's what we're hoping to do right now is to actually look with some precision at the sensation and separate it from the emotion and the mind and then just notice what the emotion and the mind has to say about it. So just noticing, just bringing awareness to it because the awareness is the very first step in being able to do anything at all with it is just noticing. That's the first thing. And then th the second thing I want to say in response to that question is that things that happen in the exercises that we're doing here, it's like a laboratory for our lives is that when the emotions and the thoughts arise in these exercises, they will arise in different parts of our life because nothing that happens here has not already arisen in our lives. So it's kind of like a laboratory for our lives. So we are practicing noticing what goes on for us. So for example, if I notice that every time my boss looks at me, my shoulders go up around my ears, and then I start to bring awareness to that, then I could maybe make the decision to notice that sensation arising and it, it's it's so quickly tied into the mind and body are so intimately tied together that this is almost automatic and what I want to do is bring awareness. It would allow me the ability to actually relax that area of my body when it first starts to happen is that if I can slow things down enough and look with enough precision, I can notice when that first bit of tension comes and I can not have it happen. I can breathe into it and relax as opposed to crunching up my shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, do we have time for another couple of questions? Linda? Yes. Yes. Okay. So one of our attendees asked, uh, in her family of origin, the rule was that, or I'll, I'll read it this way, in my family of origin, the belief rule was that my mother, who was in chronic pain, was a complainer and crazy. As a result, I've learned to ignore my pain. For the most part, I find this to have been helpful. So why would I want to be more aware of the pain? Hmm. It's an interesting, very interesting question. And I don't know that when we're looking at our rules and we're looking at things in our lives, we're not looking at them with the thought to changing them. And maybe we don't want to change them. Maybe we don't want to change them, and maybe they work for us really, really well. What we're inviting everyone to do is just assess. Just assess. Bring it out and look at it. Bring it out and dust it out and dust it off and look at this belief. And if it's possible, explore with a gentle kindness. Okay, what does this do? If I ignore my pain, what what happens in my mind and body when I ignore my pain? And so it, it's a very um, a layered question, really, is that, is it helpful? Is it helpful to me? Does it make the pain go away? Does it make the pain worse? Am I tightening around it? Am I holding my body tense? Am I getting angry about it? What is going on for me? And so... That question is one that only a person themselves can answer because everyone's way of being with it will be different. So it's with this gentle, kind curiosity, just noticing, okay, does this work for me? And how does it work for me? Is it helpful for me? That's all we're, all we're inviting people to do is look and, and assess, is this helpful or is it not? With a, with a brutal honesty with oneself, so looking w within oneself. And no one has to know what we discover. No one ever has to know this. So we can be really honest with ourselves. We just have to be really courageous with ourselves to notice am I be how am I behaving and how am I holding this? What goes on for me when I do this? And does this work for me? Is this good for me? Mm -hmm. I have another quick question here. One of our attendees writes, I often have tinnitus, and the ringing seems to get louder while I'm meditating. Any thoughts or suggestions on how to reduce the volume of my tinnitus if I experience it while meditating? And, and again, this is another sensation in the body. So a sensation, a sound, uh, a situation in the body. So if there's a way of holding it gently and kindly and noticing what goes on around this? You know, noticing the area around the sound, noticing how we're holding it in our body, noticing the story of it. If we can notice the things that arise around it, just noticing it is, it's, it's there, it's a part of who we are, and holding it gently like a small child. This is a part of me. This is who I am. Just becoming aware and holding it as gently as possible. And I always think this image of cradling a small child is helpful in holding some some area of the body that's somewhat a sensation, just holding it mentally and kindly and noticing. So it's just about noticing and bringing awareness to. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we have time for one more question. And uh, sorry that we didn't get to everybody's questions, but we maybe, um, Linda, we can try to answer the leftover questions um, at the beginning of next session if we have time. Yes. Yes, we will do that for sure. Okay. Um, we have a, um, a question about striving. As I go through the list of attitudes and get to striving, I realize that it has been easy to get stuck with this. My pain came on quickly as a result of an accident, and it's taken tremendous striving to heal. What I hear now is to let some of this go, even though what I've found is that now, three years in, that I need to be the one holding on to the desire to continue to improve. There's a real duality in the striving in this case. 
Okay, that's a really layered question again is, yes, there is a duality in it all. And I think if, if with, again, a gentle kindness, just exploring what is this like in my body when I find myself striving to make it better or change it or improve it or what, whatever I am trying to do, what is this, what is this in my body? What does it feel like? Where do I experience it in the body? And how am I holding it? How am I holding it? And just bringing awareness to how I'm holding it and then maybe being able to hear the mind, what the mind has to say about it. What is the story about it? Is there a longer story about it? Is there a bit of a discussion about it? And then if if there's awareness around the emotion. So bringing awareness, in a way, kind of shining a flashlight on this sensation feeling in the body and what arises in my mind body as a result of my doing this. What happens? Just noticing, just with a gentle, non-judgmental curiosity and just becoming aware and noticing. And that's all that we're doing right now is just becoming aware and also being really honest with ourselves. Is this helpful? Is this helpful to me? Does this help me? And not with any rationalization of I'm doing this because of this and this and this, but just is this helpful to me? Just kindly, gently saying to ourselves, okay, what what is going on for me here? So looking. Uh, they're all the answers. Are, yes. We're, we're, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're, we're getting to the end of our hour. So I'm wondering if maybe you could just um, let the attendees know if there's any exercises or homework that you recommend that they attempt. I'd like to invite people to continue with the body scan this week. And if you can do it every day this week from a comfortable position and adjusting your, your position so that you're comfortable. And with the, with the intention of just noticing. And then the other part that I'd like to bring in this week is to ask people to choose one two-minute activity a day, such as having a shower or brushing your teeth or walking the dog and bringing awareness to that two-minute period of time. Just noticing what goes on in the mind and body and the emotion at that point in time. So practicing the awareness in a specific way for this week. So in the body scan and in the uh, one, two minute per day mindfulness activity of being present in the moment. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm just going to take the presenter um, status from you for a moment. And there we go. Um, so I'd, on behalf of uh, Pain BC and uh, the Canadian Institute for the Relief of Pain and Disability, I want to thank you, Linda, so much again for sharing your insights with us uh, this morning. Um, I'd like to uh, let everybody know that uh, we will be sending out a link to the um, a recording of, of part two, as well as to uh, the PowerPoint presentation and the audio downloads. So watch for that uh, email, and please register for the remaining three parts of this series. Um, so until uh, next week, I hope you have a week um, as free as possible from pain, and uh, we'll see you all uh, next week. Goodbye. <laughs>